one of the Hall of Fame ballot elections is about to be announced. And perhaps some people who should already be in the Hall of Fame will be getting good news, even if it's kind of too late. This is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. Thank you so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen, as we're available on all your podcast platforms for free. And this episode is being, well, it's being recorded on the fifth day of December 2021 on Sunday. I'm either dropping it on Sunday or Monday. It depends on when we're getting all the information. I'll explain why I don't know everything just yet. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Lockdown MLB Pods. Same handle for Instagram. You can follow me at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. If you have a smart device, be sure to tell it to play podcast Lockdown MLB or check out some of the other great shows in the Lockdown Podcast Network, including Lockdown Bets with your boy Q and terrific analysis from Lee Sterling, which captures all of your gambling needs. Well, big football day today, and I can't tell you anything about it because I don't follow football anymore. I really hope the Boston Breakers are doing well. That's on Locked On USFL. Um, the, there's going to be, in just a few minutes, I'm recording this. It's just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday afternoon, and they're going to be announcing there's going to be which ones. It's the Golden, the Early Baseball Era Committee and the Golden Days Era Committee are going to be announcing the winners of if someone's going to be elected to the Hall of Fame from their ballots. And so I don't know the answer yet. I don't know the answer. You do because you're living in the future, but uh, I don't know. And this is always kind of a strange thing to me that you have, I mean, the writers elect the members of the hall of fame. They've been doing that since the beginning. There has been politics involved in it. There has been subjectivity involved in it there's been controversy involved there's people who have been elected to the hall of fame which you know and and let me put it this way i'm I'm just going to state this in terms of players who have been elected to the hall of fame even ones that i personally would not have elected i don't really have a bone to pick because there's nobody Let's just, and I hate that this has happened because he's a fine player. He had a wonderful career, but Harold Baines seems to be the one that everyone kind of scratched their head about. It doesn't make me mad that Harold Baines is in the Hall of Fame. I would not have voted for him. I don't think he was a Hall of Famer. I think he was a wonderful player who had a terrifically long career. Uh, But the fact that he's in the Hall of Fame does not upset me because he is a fine player who, by all accounts, was a good man and was a fan favorite in Chicago and was a world champion as a coach and an all-star multiple times. So I don't really, it doesn't bother me. You know, there's some, I would not have voted. I don't know if I would have voted for Trevor Hoffman, but it doesn't upset me that he's in the hall of fame. Okay. So anyone who's in there based upon, I don't know if they met my personal criteria, I'm fine with. You could point to Phil Rizzuto, who I think should have been, in as a broadcaster, he was put in as a player through one of the veterans committees. It was worth it if for no other reason to hear Phil Rizzotto's speech that he gave in 1994, which was hilarious. Okay, it's a Hall of Fame. It's a place to celebrate players. I don't want to be too precious. I guess I'm more of a big hall person. There are people who are in the Hall of Fame who I think hurt baseball and hurt society. You know, Tom Yawkey's in the Hall of Fame. He hurt society. He was a horrible human being, and he should be taken out of the Hall of Fame. There are people in there who we know are terrible people. We know Bobby Cox is a terrible person, and he's in the Hall of Fame. And that upsets me more than someone like Harold Baines. But when we go in back, sometimes you're correcting some of the mistakes that have been made over the years. Like The writers did not elect uh, Bobby Doerr. The writers did not elect Orlando Cepeda. There's some that the... 
uh, the writers didn't elect uh, Alan Trammell. So sometimes you the the committees uh, are brought in and and correct past mistakes. Um, the early baseball era, which uh, officially says candidates whose primary contributions came before 1950. Um, most of the people in this ballot have ties to the Negro Leagues. John Donaldson, Bud Fowler, Vicaris, Home Run Johnson, Cannonball Redding, Tubby Scales, you just bring them in for their nicknames, nonetheless, and of course, Buck O'Neill. And then there are three other ones, uh, Bill Dolan, Lefty O'Doul, and Allie Reynolds are on the ballot. Lefty O'Doul is legendary in San Francisco and you know had a fine career in the major leagues. Is, there's the bridge next to the stadium in San Francisco, which I think is called Oracle Park now. I'm sorry, they keep changing it. It's called the Lefty O'Doul Bridge. He was one of the big figures in San Francisco baseball. Allie Reynolds was a big star for the Yankee teams. I get a little wary of bringing in the major leaguers from that era because th that era has been dissected and trisected and quadrisected and drawn and quartered left and right. But alas, we're, we're taking a look at them and fine. I, I Again, I'm not going to have a problem if they bring any of them in. Every name I just said is someone who is deceased. So it'll be the ancestors of, or not sorry, the descendants. <laughs> it won't be the ancestors, I'm sorry, it'll be the descendants of those players. And um, we'll get to that in a second. There is a golden days, and again, I kind of bristle when I hear some of these eras being called like the golden days. You have um, three living candidates, Tony Oliva, Mari Wills, and Jim Cott. There are strong arguments for all of them. Uh, I'm kind of surprised Jim Cott's not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Oliva and Mari Wills both had wonderful careers. Uh, then there's several who have died already. Uh, Roger Maris, who obviously had an amazing peak, not quite sure it was enough for the Hall of Fame, but see Harold Baines. I'm not going to have a problem with that. Uh, Minnie Minosa, Danny Murtaugh, who managed two World Series champions with the Pirates. Uh, Billy Pierce had a great career with the Chicago White Sox. Gil Hodges, who tragically died in spring training of 1972, was a star player for the Dodgers and managed the Mets to the World Championship in 69. Ken Boyer uh, and Dick Allen. Okay, I don't know. They're going to announce a couple of names. Maybe a name or two will be announced. Maybe not. Sometimes they say, yeah, we're not enough. You have to get like nine out of 12 or 10 out of 12. There's some sort of, there's, the committee has to have a certain percentage. Okay, we could have none. Here's part of my problem about some of this. I recognize a lot of these names because they were stars. And I also remember pulling shots of some of these people like Minnie Minosa, like Dick Allen, like Billy Pierce, for my in memoriam videos. They're gone. The only three who are still with us are Cot, Oliva, or Mari Wills. But Dick Allen was on one of these ballots, what, five or six years ago. And he missed by one vote. That committee had him miss by one vote. We could have had a moment because Dick Allen died just last year. We could have had a moment where Dick Allen, who was slighted in his career, was underrated in his career. It is only recently that we have looked at his career and people have been able to assess his career and realize, oh my goodness, statistically, he was one of the best hitters of his era. And when you consider the fact that he was hitting in a pitcher's era and you weigh the fact that he had incredible strikes against him as a hitter, you can make the argument he was one of the great offensive players, had one of the great offensive peaks in the history of baseball overall, considering the era, considering this, he was facing the Kofaxes and the Drysdales and the Marischals and the Gaylord Perrys all the time. Probably saved the White Sox from moving from Chicago. Also, he had his MVP season with the White Sox, and the White Sox contended in 72, the same year I was born, the same year Gil Hodges died. Dick Allen could be in the Hall of Fame posthumously, but we had the chance to celebrate the man's career while he was alive. Same with Minnie Minosa. Broke the color barrier in Chicago, 
beloved figure for decades and decades and decades. Tremendous player. Pioneer. Did more for the game than Tom Yawkey. And they had a chance to celebrate that as a Hall of Famer while he was alive. His obituary could have said Hall of Famer Minnie Minoso, Hall of Famer Dick Allen, Hall of Famer Billy Pierce, who also died just a couple of years ago. Now, unless I'm mistaken, Billy Pierce hasn't won any games in the last few years. Dick Allen hasn't gotten more RBIs. Minnie Minoso hasn't stolen any more bases. And then a few years ago, we had a chance to have Buck O'Neill be in the Hall of Fame. How would that have hurt the Hall of Fame to be able to have him, a man who was a wonderful player, a wonderful manager during the Negro Leagues? Would he have been a great manager? Yeah, probably. Broke the color barrier as a coach with the Chicago Cubs. And then later discovered talents like Ernie Banks, like Lee Smith like, you know, players who became Hall of Famers themselves, a great eye for baseball, a great brain for baseball, a great heart for baseball, and became the great spokesman for the Negro Leagues all during the last years of his life, starting with his wonderful appearances on uh, Ken Burns' baseball. But he fell just short. So some of these names could be in the Hall of Fame. But why does it have to be posthumous? We saw that with Ron Santo. Ron Santo, who had a great career with the Cubs, didn't make it in through the writers, was dragged along, missed one of the veteran committee votes, died, and was put in posthumously. So instead of having the wonderful, raucous Ron Santo celebration, my God, that would have been, he was such a fun, you know, not always, you know, sometimes in Biden and grabbed a drink, it wasn't always a Pepsi. And you would have had Cub fans cheering him, who loved him from the 69 team, loved him as an announcer, was such a great Cub all those years, would have been a great celebration. Instead, when he was put in, people's handkerchiefs were like, oh, I wish he could have been here. Posthumous election to the Hall of Fame should be reserved for, you know, granted, when you have the players of the, the Negro Leaguers who, like Turkey Stearns, the great a uh, player who, friend of the podcast, Vanessa, <laughs> I'm sorry, Vanessa Ivy Rose's uh, grandfather um, was put in postures because people had to catch up with the legacy of the Negro Leagues, and we still are, okay? That's one thing. Or if someone dies, you know, Gil Hodges died in 72, you know, when Roberto Clemente died in the plane crash, or when Roy Halliday died a few years ago. You know, when something like that happens and they're elected posthumously, okay, yeah, then you bust out the handkerchiefs. There was no need to bust out handkerchiefs for Buck O'Neill or for Dick Allen or for Billy Pierce or for Minnie Minosa. There was no need to have this have been posthumous. And I don't even know if they've been in. And if any of them, you know, I think Dick Allen absolutely has to be in. I think Buck O'Neill absolutely has to be in. You, I think you can make strong arguments for Minosa and everyone else I just mentioned. Great. You know, and if they put in Gil Hodges, great. I'm not going to fight that. And there's some weird thing that's something like, well, it has to be either as a player or as a manager. It can't be both. Said, Why not? He had a baseball life. You can't have a better baseball life than Gil Hodges or Buck O'Neill for that matter. But. Uh, The second part of this podcast is going to be after I find out who won the dang thing, if anyone got elected. I don't know if anyone did or not, but it's just very frustrating to me that any of these could possibly be a posthumous election to the Hall of Fame when there was no need for it to be posthumous. There was none. And we could just have had a celebration for these wonderful figures in baseball history and celebrate while they're alive instead of waiting for them to be dead. So we're going to see what happens. We're going to watch it. I'm going to watch it on my device. But it gets really complicated. There are all sorts of devices you could be having there. And does this sound familiar to you? you got one device that lets you watch the game or the announcements for, 
And then you have another where you stream your favorite shows and you're watching sports highlights on your phone. You got your neighbor's password for all the good stuff. It's a mess. I want to tell you a way to get all that entertainment that you love without the hassle. It's a great way to get your television together. It's called Direct TV Stream. And it brings your live TV on demand and all the streaming stuff together like never before. You can watch your favorite sports, movies, shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part is there's no annual contract. And so get rid of the clutter and the confusion. Get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible devices required and content varies by package. Okay, um, I'm going to just break down the positive first because I'm a positive person. Six people are going to be going to the Hall of Fame uh, that were announced today, and that's great. I like having a big celebration, and several of the people who are going to be – there are two people who are alive. Tony Oliva is still with us, and Tony Oliva is going to the Hall of Fame. Jim Cott is still with us. He's going to the Hall of Fame. Uh, and I think those are both, I'm, I'm very happy with both of them. Jim Cott had an, uh, as you just, people know him as a, as a broadcaster now. Um, he's, I think he's had some really tremendous years as a broadcaster, some not so great years recently, but pitched for 25 years, workhorse, probably the best fielding pitcher of his era um, you know, if you like wins, he won 283 games, but he was a member of a World Series champion with the Cardinals later in his career. Had great years with uh, the original Senators, with the Minnesota, mainly with the Minnesota Twins. He pitched 15 years of his career with Minnesota, had several great years with Chicago White Sox, was a solid pitcher with Philadelphia as well. Um, and I think that's really great that he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, his teammate, Tony Oliva, this is going to be a big, big ceremony if you're a Minnesota Twins fan because you've got two great twins who are in there. And Oliva is still with us. He's 83 years old, uh, three-time batting champion, spent his whole career, his whole major league career with the Minnesota Twins uh, and did so, as I as we mentioned with Dick Allen before, uh, put up great hitting numbers in a pitcher's era. And that to me is, you know, that's something to – that I look at as uh, a big reason to support his candidacy, you know, and I'm, and once again, I'm glad that this is happening while he is, um, while he's still alive. Um, many men now that you have a couple ones who are uh, no longer with us. Uh, mini Minosa, again, I, why this didn't happen while the man was still alive as he lived, uh, you know, he lived to be 80. He was nearly 90 years old when he died. You know, he broke barriers, but was beyond just a pioneer. He also led the league in hits and many years, you know, he led the league in stolen bases and triples, was an MVP candidate and a gold glove winner. And he wound up playing, you know, he played in the 40s and the 50s and then played a handful of games with the 76 White Sox and a pair of games with the 1980 White Sox. So he wound up playing in uh, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. He wound up playing in five different decades uh, along the way, mainly with the Chicago White Sox. But, you know, he also played a year with the Cardinals. He's broke in with the Cleveland Indians. Um, and um, he also played for the Senators one year. So and that's a deserving one as well. And there was, and Gil Hodges, who, again, there was no chance to put him in before he died in 72. Great player for the Brooklyn Dodgers. It's been a huge push for, as long as I can remember, there's been a push to put Gil Hodges in the Hall of Fame. And he's finally in, and he can finally be labeled as a Hall of Famer, Gil Hodges. And, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful, and, and, and deservedly so. Um, there's two that were brought in from the, uh, from the, uh, early what was it the the early baseball era? Bud Fowler, who was a pioneer player, African American, who played in the 19th century and was considered to be one of the one of the first black players to make a name for himself in that era, and was considered a great player at the time. 
and we should celebrate players who were pioneers and did great things in the game. Uh, needless to say, he's no longer with us. And Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill is in it, everything positive about baseball is in Buck O'Neill. Everything. He did everything you could ask as a player, as a manager, as a coach, as a scout, as an ambassador. Like Gil Hodges, he lived a baseball life, made the game of baseball better. We had an opportunity to have him be a Hall of Famer in his lifetime. And that didn't happen. We had an opportunity to have what would have been probably one of the best speeches at a Hall of Fame ceremony. We were denied that. But at least the man's legacy from this day forward is that of a Hall of Famer. Um, I, Bob Kendrick and everyone at the, uh, the, the Negro Leagues Museum in uh, Kansas City obviously had a strong connection with him. He was a, uh, Bob was a, a guest on our podcast uh, a little while ago. And I'm sure this is a big event for him uh, and also because of Minosa and also because of everything else. But um, I really hope that there's a celebration in Kansas City for him and some acknowledgement with the Royals. Uh, I'm sure they will. They seem to be an organization with a good head on their shoulders. So, and we're probably going to have this, and we're going to have a crowded Hall of Fame ballot. I like ceremonies where there's lots of people, where it looks like an Earth, Wind, and Fire concert with all the people lined up there. So I think that it's going to be great. And I think that I, I have no problem with any of these names. None. Zero. You know, we're celebrating these players. We're celebrating their legacies. Whether or not you agreed with this or that, they all have a reason to be celebrated, even for, for something that is off the field as well. And that should be part of it. Let's celebrate the good parts of this game. Let's celebrate the history. Let's celebrate the foundations that these wonderful men put down towards the game. I wanted to get the positive out because I'm a little steamed at something here. And I thought something could be corrected. But alas, it wasn't. And like before, it missed stupidly. And I, you know what? I'm going to need a little bit of energy to get going on this next segment. And so for that, I may have to grab for a Built Bar. And let me tell you something, Built Bars are the best tasting protein bars ever. And this holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, even better than a candy bar. Built Bars filled with so much goodness, rich and decadent in flavor, covered in chocolate, and low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat. It gives you that extra fuel to bust down those mall doors and battle all the holiday shoppers because it's the season of peace and love. Don't bring up your favorite Built Bar flavors at family parties because people are so passionate about their favorite flavor. Now look it, you want to cozy up to something warm? Here's a holiday secret. Dip your Built Bar into a piping hot cup of cocoa, let it melt a little, and give your beverage a little bit of that Built Bar flavor. Plus you have a nice melty Built Bar to go with it. So be sure to have a couple of napkins at hand. Look for some of the new marshmallow treats around the holidays. You need to get your hands on Built Bar Puffs. They're light, they're fluffy, marshmallow through and through. Different flavors all covered in chocolate. Tastes so good, you won't believe they're filled with protein. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your order at Built.com for those Built Bars. I understand that when Dick Allen played, he didn't have the most cuddly personality. He was an African-American man playing in a racially charged time for an organization that had probably the worst reputation in baseball. And that was the Philadelphia Phillies of the 1960s, other than, of course, Tom Yawkey and the Red Sox. Tom Yawkey's in the Hall of Fame. I want to remind everyone that Tom Yawkey's in the Hall of Fame. And along the way, he clashed with the press how much of that was because he didn't smile when they asked him to smile we don't know okay but in a pitcher's era dick allen put up numbers that would be all-star caliber numbers in any era he led the league in almost any category you would want and was a sabermetrics darling before anyone knew what that meant and then when his time in Philadelphia ended, 
with the press and the fans turning against him. He turned it around, landed with the Chicago White Sox, won the American League MVP, and probably saved the White Sox from moving elsewhere in the year where he led the league in virtually every category. He was one of the best statistical hitters of the era and did so over a decade of great production. And he missed the vote once again by one. A couple of years ago, when he was still alive, he could have been elected if one more person put his name in. Today, once again, he needed 12 votes. He got 11. Do people just not like him? I mean, at this time, it seems personal that two times he came up one vote shy, that almost everyone agrees, yeah, yeah, but the one, one other person says, yeah, I think Dick Allen. You know, was it because he didn't get along with some of the people on the committee? Was it because he thought that, hey, uh, I, I, you know what, I don't know. I don't know. I was mad that he didn't get elected while he was alive. Now, when the writers had a chance to vote for him, and the writers didn't seem to like him for reasons that I probably hinted at before, uh, he was on the ballot 14 times, 14 times from 1983 to 1997, and he never busted 20%, but he always stayed on the ballot. And then twice he was on uh, committee ballots, and both times he missed by a single vote. And um, yeah, this is uh, frustrating. You know, I thought it was frustrating that he couldn't be let in uh, while he was alive. As people are now starting to realize what a great player he was. Excuse me, sniffle. But now, twice, committees who are supposed to be here to correct some of these problems. Didn't let him in. Well, it's the Hall of Fame is there to have arguments, to bring frustration, to have you shrug. And um, I wanted, I, I purposely layered this podcast to accentuate the positive. Gil Hodges is a Hall of Famer. Minnie Minosa is a Hall of Famer. Um, Jim Cott is a Hall of Famer. Bud Fowler is a Hall of Famer. Um, who was the uh, Tony Oliva is a Hall of Famer. Buck O'Neill is a Hall of Famer. They all should be. And that's great. It's wonderful. And that's what we should celebrate. Dick Allen should be there too. And we're going to have a very, very crowded ballot going on. And I'm going to be going through this ballot um, over the next couple of weeks. And, you know, this is something, certainly something to go over when we're doing some of the off-season stuff and certainly during a lockout. But we have, you know, we have Bonds still on the ballot. We have Clemens still on the ballot. And let's, 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 who do we have on the ballot? Let's take a look what we have on the ballot because, you know, some people are going to get in. We're, we're the world of ones who are. Um, so we have, uh, let's just go here for a second. Just, just let me just pull this up here for a second. Bonds, Clemens, A-Rod, Schilling, Manny Ramirez, Scott Rowland, Andrew Jones, Todd Helton, Gary Sheffield, Bobby Abreu, Sammy Sosa, and Gar and Andy Pettit are the ones who should get at least have the and David Ortiz should have the um, the biggest conversations about them, uh, and those are the ones we should be debating about. But at least two or three of them are going to be elected, plus the six who are chosen today. So it should be a nice crowded celebration. Dick Allen should be there too, but. There you go. Maybe someday I'll make this. Maybe I'll be one of the podcasters elected to the Hall of Fame. Maybe you can start a writing campaign for that. By the way, thanks so much for making us your first listen as we're available on all your free podcasting platforms. If you need a second listen, make sure to make it 
Locked on Bets with your boy Q, and analysis from Lee Sterling. Talking down, talking about, talking around the Hall of Fame selections, all the really good ones, all the ones that are terrific, and the one who was left off that is really, really frustrating. This has been Locked on MLB for the fifth day of December, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.